Um, could we have the slides up on here, folks? Um, thank you. Um, we're going to have, well, try to get an hour of you, the artists. Um, pa um, Paris asked me to talk about investigations in Uviatus. It's before lunch, so we've got to spice it up a little bit and a bit more interesting. Um, we can't cover all the investigations we could possibly do in Uviatus, but um, these are some tips and some tricks. This is more practical advice rather than a whole list of tests you could do. Um, I, I don't have any commercial disclosures. Um, well, this is the wrong way to investigate Uviatus. It's just to fire as many tests as we can at the patient, I may talk about blood tests or radiologists, anything we like. Um, uh, scattergun testing is, is not uh, a very intelligent way of doing it. Um, it's, it's expensive, for, for most conditions it makes no sense. Um, it can cause anxiety as well. If you start MRI uh, imaging patients with intermediate uveitis, uh, you can pick up all sorts of non-progressive radiologically isolated lesions which actually have nothing to do with MS. And that causes a lot of anxiety. So you need to be careful what you do. Um, this is a key slide in the talk. It's uh, to get our heads around the, uh, how we approach uh, diagnostic testing. And then that could apply to uh, MAC T injectasia, for example, an angiogram appearance uh, in a suspicious patient with a funny-looking macula or something. So this, this applies to anything we do every day of the week as, as clinicians. And the bottom line is, is we've got to figure out what the the likelihood of the disease is before we do that test, and that's maybe like age, ethnicity, demographics, um, clinical features, risk factors, travel, does he keep any pets? And then, and then we do a test, or a whole bunch of tests, and depending on the results, it, the, the probability of the disease goes up or down. And that's, there's a mathematics to this, which I'm not really going to get into, but um, this, this uh, directs our testing. And... This is one of the reasons why just firing millions of tests at our patients doesn't really work, that the actual probability of each condition in UVS is quite low. They're all quite rare. Um, it might go up and down a little bit, but that's, num that's problem number one, is that the pretest probability of, of a specific uveitis condition is quite low. Um, and problem number two is that most of our tests are, are, are not very good. There's a few exceptions, and I'll talk about those, but often they're... They have some sensitivity in specimens, which is useful, but they're by no means 100%. So most of our tests are, are not as good as we'd like to think. Just as an illustration, um, we, we, we developed like a little application to calculate this for common uh, uh, conditions of anterior uveitis, and we plugged it into a, uh, a little formula, and um, it would give you the probability of it being a specific anterior uveitis type condition, and um, you, this was published a few years back. Uh, you can look it up. Um, this is a pretty busy slide, but it, it's not as difficult as it looks, but basically you, you put all the clinical features in. This is a patient presenting with acute anterior uveitis, and you put the age, acute onset, were there, were there KPs? Um, did he have some other symptoms, sacroaliitis, coughing, uh, nail pitting, any, anything sort of that might give you a clue? And um, this is a patient with acute anterior uveitis. The, the likelihood of it, 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 this is the sort of pre-test probability. Most of it's going to be idiopathic, actually. Uh, and then there's other conditions that we recognize, maybe like B27, um, Bechet's psoriatic arthropathy. And then, um, well, should we test this patient for B27? Uh, well, the, the pre-test pre probability is about 50-50. And... Um, so we'll think, well, should we test it? But what's the most valuable tool that we, forget, that we possess in our armamentarium? And it's actually what we ask the patient. Uh, that is the most valuable tool. Um, we ask the patient, do you have inflammatory type back pain? And you, it, it's a simple question, stiffness in the morning, pain. He says, yes. It suddenly raises the probability of it being B27 associated anterior uveitis, possibly linked with ankylosing spondylitis, hugely, and we should test. So the, the post-test probability is really shot up. That's how the sort of mathematics of it works. Um, here's another one. Uh, another patient walks in with, with unilateral anterior uveitis, quite common in Greece. You know, you know, well, should we do a B51? It's sort of screen for Bechet's. Um, well, Again, if you look at the mathematics, the likelihood of it being Bechet's is quite low, just walking through the door. Um, 
uh, you've got a couple of other conditions that are on the list. Um, Bechet's is rare. Um, and it's, the B51 test is actually quite poorly predictive. Um, it's sensitivity about 70%, something like so. It varies in populations, actually. Um, and uh, it doesn't make any sense just randomly testing all your um, anterior uveitis patients for B51. But again, if you ask a question, do you have mouth ulcers, uh, the pretest or the post question probability of this being a Bechet's related uh, uveitis goes up hugely. And you should test and you should refer. So you can see how our pretest is changed by the observation of or, or the history of a mouth ulcer. So if, if we look at um, what, what, are, what the, the tests we do, I'm generally going to talk about blood tests. Um, and there's some awful tests, uh, and then there's some average ones, and there's a couple of really good ones, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. Um, these are the ugly ones. These, these are just overused, poorly done, and, and, and really not helpful. Uh, ANA, blood testing, I go crazy when my residents tick that box uh, for patients presenting with uveitis. Um, it is estimated it's a 1% chance of a patient with a positive ANA and a uveitis syndrome having lupus. That's pretty low. Um, Lyme serology is, again, a massive can of worms if you're just randomly ordering Lyme serology. There's a lot of other conditions that will give you a false positive rheumatoid, for example. And if you're not in a Lyme endemic uh, region, and I don't think Greece is particularly Lyme endemic, maybe northern Greece possibly in the mountainous areas, but in reality, if you're not in Lyme endemic, you shouldn't do Lyme testing. And, and anyone that thinks Q Gold is going to give you the diagnosis of TB um, uh, related uveitis, you're in for a big disappointment. There's a few publications we've published to show that your Q-Gold test is almost as good as tossing a coin in terms of um, differentiating a, a response to anti-TB therapy in a patient you suspect as having tuberculous uveitis. So these are not good tests. We, we need better tests. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what about sarcoidosis? I've, I've chosen sarcoid because it's a very common condition. We see a lot of manifestations in the uveitis clinic. We do a ton of tests, and how good are they? Um, these are the revised um, sort of diagnostic uh, criteria for ocular sarcoid. Um, Narsing Rao's group, they published a couple of years ago something. Well, it's, it's great to have a biopsy proven sarcoid, you know, chest uh, node, but we, 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 we often don't get that, and we're not going to go and biopsy the eye. Well, it's very rare. You, you may biopsy the conge, possibly, but the reality is we don't often get a biopsy diagnosis. Presumed, well, you can have... Um, benign hyalolymphadenopathy with some ocular signs. And then pr a lot of patients fall into the probable group where they've got uh, ocular features that we uh, are suggestive of sarcoid and we're going to rely on some systemic investigations. And there's a whole list of them. We've got chest x-ray in here, raised serum ACE. We're all uh, familiar with that. Lysozyme. Uh, some of you may not be aware that Many patients with sarcoid have low lymphocyte counts because if you've got systemic sarcoid, you actually deplete your lymphocytes. So you can do, you can just look at the lymphocyte count. So the whole protein of different tests that we use in um, interleukin two levels. I'll come on in a minute. Um, are they any good? Well, um, these are the sort of tests we might do: uh, chest X-ray, looking for hyaluronic lymphadenopathy. We can do CT scanning. We can send them to physicians for uh, bronchial biopsies. It depends how far you want to take it. Um, but how good are these tests? Well, there's an interesting publication uh, fairly recently that tried to look at this. These were uh, patients where sarcoid could have been a diagnosis, it was a reasonable diagnosis, and they looked at um, sort of biopsy-proven cases, and they looked at the agreement between all the tests. So these were a collection of patients that had a lot of investigations for sarcoid, and uh, a small number had a sort of gold standard. And the, the, but one of the interesting things is that the serum ACE isn't particularly good, unfortunately. If you look at the sensitivity and specificity um, up on the top table, um, it's about sort of, well, it's really 50%, sort of uh, even lower. The specificity is a bit better. Um, chest X-ray, if you have hyalolymphadenopathy on the chest X-ray, then um, sarcoidosis is, is very probable. But the problem is a lot of patients don't have hyalolymphadenopathy and they still have sarcoid. So it's useful, but it's not, it, it has low sensitivity. Um, one thing was something called serum interleukin levels. 
a fairly uh, newish test that some of you may not be aware of. It's um, a protein-bound uh, receptor, and there's a soluble version that's in the blood, and you can measure it. And sarcoid is, is one of two or three diseases where that's raised. Um, uh, you can get it in a couple of other conditions. Um, inflammatory rheumatoid, lupus, you can get raised. And they looked at the IL-2 levels, and they combined it with a chest X-ray finding. So if you had... Um, uh, abnormal chest x-ray with raised IL-2. It actually outperformed the serum ACE. Um, it, it wasn't too bad in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Um, this your Uden uh, number is, is the kind of overall how good the test is. And it was a little bit better than using serum ACE. Okay, so, you know, these are some... There's no perfect test for sarcoid. We have to look at the whole armamentarium. Um, we do have a couple of really good tests in uveitis. There's not that many... Um, we have sensitive syphilis serology, which has very, very high sensitivity and specificity. So if you see a patient with an, uh, uh, an acute uh, uveitis that, that could be syphilis, now there's a big protein manifestations of that, but any patient with acute ocular inflammation, you should really think about ruling out treponemal disease, particularly if they're a male patient, because this tends to be a disorder of men, and we know that from epidemiology. Um, so we have very, very high sensitivity and specificity. So what that means, if you suspect it and you get a positive test, the odds of it being syphilis-related uveitis goes up hugely, 15%, really, really high. So we've got a, a big big smiley face there, okay? Um, AC tap for viral retinitis. If you see a patient walk in with an acute um, uh, retinitis, you're worrying about ARN. Uh, there is a differential to ARN, toxo, other things can do, tre treponemal can do this. If you do an AC tap, again, it has pretty good sensitivity and specificity for, for viral um, retinitis, so you can rule that out. And, of course, the other disease we all know about is, is, is birdshot, which is, has an extraordinarily strong linkage with the A29 haplotype. It's the strongest in medicine. So in, in ophthalmology, we have the strongest HLA association. So if you see a patient, again... You shouldn't be blanket testing all your patients for A29, but if you see a Northern European, this is not a, generally a disease of Mediterraneans. We can get it, but this is a Northern European white patient with these kind of birdshot lesions. You do the A29 test, it's positive. The likelihood of this being birdshot goes about 40 times. A massive effect. Okay, so we talked a little bit about Bayesian statistics, how it can help us. Well, actually, we're all... Uh, Bayesian clinicians, although we often don't realize it, um, because we apply, we take a history, and we do some tests. Um, I'm just going to give you an example. There's no mathematics in this, so you, you don't have to fall asleep. Um, this is a true patient. Uh, it came a few years ago to Morfields. He was a Japanese male, hearing loss, sudden uh, panuviatus, acute AC activity, hot discs, and fluid. Anyone like to suggest one diagnosis this might be? VKH, yeah, you know, I mean, well, that, that's what the resident thought, and they read the books, and that's fair enough, okay? So we, we give the patient high-dose steroids. When I say we, I didn't see the patient for a, a few days, so I didn't, but someone did, and um, they gave him high-dose steroids. Now, normally, we'd expect VKH to respond to high-dose steroids, you know, if the patient had taken the medicine, um, and that's the first test you've done. You've given them, um, uh, you know, a powerful immune suppressant. Um, he actually gets worse on steroid, which is a little bit unusual. So you say the, the pretest probability of this being VKH is 50-50, but he's got worse on steroids. That's behaving a bit unusual. That's your first test. And then you do, uh, he comes back to clinic a week later, and he's got GI symptoms. Are GI symptoms a manifestation of VKH? VKH can do a lot of things, but one of the few things it does not do is GI. Okay, it just does not affect that system. So this is looking pretty unlikely to worsen steroids, GI symptoms. And actually, he just happens to have syphilis. <laughs> He's just a Japanese male who lives in London who has syphilis. And actually, you can get hearing problems in the secondary stage of syphilis quite easily. It give you a panuviatus with fluid and, and quite a hot disc. Um, it, you know, there were a couple of very subtle features that you could look for in your angiogram, but this could mimic VKH quite easily. And um, he was also a homosexual patient with HIV and had opportunistic diseases, hence the GI symptoms. So actually, this is, tells you how, how just looking at how things are going and applying a test, uh, you can figure things out. 
Okay. Um, Moving on, because time's tight. Um, how do we make the diagnosis? Again, this is worth a thousand million tests, is actually listen to the patient. Uh, you know, we don't have protocols in uveitis. It's not like DMO and AMD. It's, it's just read that from a textbook. Yeah, I've got to actually speak to the patient. And um, the patient, it will, it will tell you the diagnosis if, if you listen to them long enough. And um, this is just one more example, a, a kind of a fun example. This is a 25-year-old um, female, lives in a very urban area in, in London. She has photopsy and blurred vision. There's really nothing in, in the medical history that we thought. Um, she's got reduced vision on the right side, a um, couple of KPs, AC activities and vitritis. Uh, she's got some fluid, intraretinal fluid. This is the left for comparison. A bit of peripheral vasculitis. We, we do a basic workup. Treponema is negative. ACE is negative. Um, there's the angiogram showing really actually quite prominent vasculitis here. Uh, diffuse leak through the run. She gets some. Uh, she has some psychiatric issues or depressions. We don't give her steroids. We give her mycophenolate, which is reasonable. And um, it kind of goes on. It doesn't do particularly well. And then she reports some joint pain um, and some headache. And then we actually re-question her properly. And um, I asked the question, do you keep any pets? Um, you know, expecting like cats and dogs. And she says, yes, I keep cows as pets. And um, she, she travels to North uh, England in Yorkshire. And her parents live on a farm. And she actually quite likes to sort of dress the cows up and kind of get close to them. And I don't know, she, she, she really likes cows. And... Um, <laughs> Not, not in a sexual sense, but just, you know, I, anyway. Um, and, and actually, what, what test would you do now? The, the smart Alex in, in the audience, okay. Lime. Cows are big animals. They carry ticks. So you don't have to just get lime from deer. You can get it from horse, horse riding cows. So we did some lime serology, which is perfectly reasonable because she has exposure. She gets it every weekend. And, of course, she's lime positive. Uh, IgG, IgM uh, positive. We stop the immune suppression. We get uh, urgent infectious disease review. Uh, brain scan shows uh, some uh, white uh, periventricular uh, inflammatory lesions, and this is neurolyme. So she's got neurolyme. Um, we give her doxycycline, and it all disappears. The, the inflammation just melts away. She gets a month of doxycycline, and uh, she feels much better. She's, she's, she's cured. So here's a little bit about Lyme disease, uh, spirochetal uh, uh, infection. Um, the uveitis is quite uncommon, actually, maybe 1% um, of, of overall Lyme cases. The, the serology and testing is difficult. Most of it will be in the sort of secondary stage that we can see. Um, they can get um, intermediate uveitis, vasculitis. Uh, it's quite common. Um, it, it, some, it has some similarities with uh, treponemal disease. It's a similar spirochetal disease. So just kind of rounding up, how to avoid catastrophes, um, think of infection, and uh, keep thinking of infection. Uh, think again of infection, and then probably if everything else is not working, uh, think of masquerade or neoplasia, a primary intraocular lymphoma. Um, and, and I'm going to call it a day there, but I'll take questions in the um, lunchtime. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, anybody who wants to pose a question? Miltos. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, that's a very good question. I don't know. <laughs> What's the risk of treating? Always the worry is that you're going to treat somebody with steroids yeah. as a trial period. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. You'll cause irreversible damage. Yes, yes. When, what are the markers of steroids? Well, the, 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 there's a simple list. I've, I've actually written a, a very simple textbook. Uh, we put my name into Amazon. I'm not plugging a book here, but it's, it's got practical advice. There's, there's no pictures in it, or hardly any. But the bottom line is that the um, uh, fungal disease and, and ARN will do extremely badly on steroids, very rapidly. So you've got a few days, but things will go totally out of control if it's viral. Uh, treponemal disease will go quite bad after a week or two. You have a very sick patient with if you inadvertently uh, give steroids for that. Um, toxo will also not do very well. Um, so you've got some, some conditions that will rapidly 
get worse. I mean, I think I always say to residents, if you have a retinitis, um, tap, put an antiviral in and, and take an AC tap, that then if you really want to give steroids, you can, and, and tick treponema serology. And then you cover quite a lot of bases. Um, TB, uveitis, you've probably got weeks and weeks and weeks, and we, we, we can't even diagnose TB anyway very well. So, so you, you can be excused for giving steroids for those. But there's not many conditions that will go crazy, but ARN is one of them, um, treponemal disease. Uh, those you've really got to try to, to rule out. And obviously um, uh, an, a septic endogenous, but I don't think you're going to miss that. They're going to have a sick patient. Well, both. I mean, you know, if you put an Ozidex in a patient that's actually got toxo, uh, choriatinitis, it will do quite badly. Um, orbital floor, it can do, you can get fulminant toxo with, 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 with local steroid, for sure. The good thing about systemic steroid, you can always stop it. But if you put that Ozidex in and, and, and you didn't look at the peripheral retina and you've got an ARN case, you, you've got a catastrophic problem here. Yeah. Prof. Uh, Tilibaris? Well, yes, I mean, that, I didn't really cover that, but I, I think we, we don't do it enough, and we should. Um, uh, herpetic and zoster, there's usually clues. Uh, the, the one condition I think I am seeing is CMV-related anterior uveitis. And um, this is typically younger patients, unilateral disease, often presents with very high pressure. They have a few KPs, and again, the, 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 the tap, uh, yield is not great in these patients. But you, you have to tap when they're very hot and you need a good lab and you combine it with the Goldman Vitma test and that kind of stuff. But we probably should be tapping those patients a little bit more. Yeah, I'd probably repeat it once. If I really want to look for CMV, uh, anterior uveitis, but actually sometimes I just take a punt and just give them a uh, topical Vergan and it works. So I take a, a pragmatic therapeutic. Uh, and the other thing is you can quite reasonably say, look, if you've got a patient with hypertensive uveitis, uh, they're coming back to A&E every, every, every three or four months, uh, and they're given a course of steroids, topical steroids, and, and suddenly you say, well, look, I'm going to give you some Valgan cyclovir intensively, and they're absolutely fine for a year. That is almost like a, a, a Bayesian test that you've given a treatment, and, and they're you know, in remission. So I probably wouldn't have those patients. I'll I'll cover that in the um uh, in the in the in, in the final talk, but but you have to, okay, if you're going to use anti TNF. So I will I have I actually got a slide on that, but the answer is you have to. Okay.